All right, so that brings us to our first user presentation. So I'd like to welcome Javier to our, our virtual podium. Javier, can you come up to the podium here and turn your camera on? Yeah, hi, Javier. How are you doing? Fine, fine, thank you. Good, good. So Javier actually first started his career in cadastral acquisition, and I think even telecommunications before, eventually moving to the ATM business, which I'm glad you did, Javier, by the way. Um, and so as a part of your, I guess, move into the aviation space, you were doing some um, development of some tools around procedure design, and then ultimately you moved into the AIS division, which is the division you now head. Is that correct? Yes, yes that's correct. Yeah. And as the head of AIS, would you say your focus is now more on innovating um, the evolution of how to deliver some of those AIS services? Yes, yeah, so that's what we are mostly uh, focused on. In. I think like, like like all IS units worldwide, we have a lot of pressure on going digital. And mm -hmm. that's uh, our main concern right now. Right, good. I, I certainly don't envy your job. Um, so, uh, and for, for, for those that don't know, Javier and I go actually go way back, I think probably to the early 2000s. And Javier, you were actually the first one that actually taught me how to ride a mountain bike, if you, if you remember <laughs> that outing. <laughs> I, I remember. I remember. Okay. It was great. Our, didn't fall, so that was great. <laughs> All right, Javier. Well, I'll let you go ahead and um, take it away from here, so you can start sh sharing your screen and um, you know tell us about powering AIM beyond aeronautical charting. Okay, so I'm sharing it Hopefully right now. Yep, we can see it. Okay, you see? It? Okay, so so thank you, Jonathan. And yes, uh, our history goes way back. And in fact, Jonathan was the, the first. I mean, it was an, an, a strong support for us when we started all this uh, project I will be talking about today and how to set up everything from the start. Because, I mean, for us, it was, it was a huge challenge how to embrace all these GIS technology and everything. So that that's. Okay, so that's uh, more or less how I, I will talk about today and, and focus on. Okay, so I, I will talk about how was our our experience uh, when setting up all these GIS project, how our our expectations have changed during on all, all this time, and uh, okay, so how when it really took some years for us to really understand what we had in in our hands. And, and now it's it's changing much much faster than much faster than what uh, we expected from the beginning. No, so we really started all this as an internal project uh, for many focus on productivity. I think so one of the problems we all have in all our IS units is okay the number of changes of the data updates that we got every every month is growing and growing, and uh, okay keeping up with that and making being able to produce the AAP and all the charts and all the products that we deliver is, is a huge challenge. Sometimes that time we take doing, doing all that work doesn't allow us to look a little, a little bit forward and to find new ways uh, to improve that. And that's, that's really what, what happened to us. So we were very, very busy working on improving our processes and internal processes for some years. And we suddenly realized that there were other ways we, we, that we could be doing our work. And uh, okay, so that's what I will try to talk about today and, and explain our project. Uh, for, for us, it's really, really, really to thank you, Jonathan and, and Eric, for setting up this, this symposium so we can share our, exper our experiences. And of course, we also learn from others' experience. So I think in our community, that, that's one of the key assets. Okay, so you said early in 2009. Uh, I think that was when we started all this project, uh, early 2000. So it's 2009 was more or less when we everything set up. So probably we started a little bit earlier, uh, setting up all, all, all the elements. And this is how our users saw us. So I work for an IS, an Aeronautic Information Service provider, and we mainly produce the IAP. So this is how our, our, our users look to us. Uh, so we have the IAP with, a, of course, everyone of you know, it's a very structured document uh, with a number of, section, of sections, 
Most of them are based on PDF files with a lot of text. And uh, for some of them, there's a long chart also and tabular data and a huge number of charts. We also have the NOTAMs. So the NOTAMs down there, which are the like the SMS uh, for the aviation, we have how to how to provide the urgent um, messages to to our users. But the main, I mean, for us at least, uh, the main workload goes on updating the AIP. The AIP is updated once a month, well, every 28 days, and that's huge work to maintain everything uh, up to date. The AIP is a very complex document with many, many many links between different sections some data is, is published in many places in many charts so making sure that everything is consistent and up to date uh, was very much uh, time consuming so this is how uh, we work it out uh, uh, as then so we come from cat drawings focusing on how we build all these charts that are very very much interconnected so we come for from cat we were using MicroStation 95 uh, by then. We were very happy with it. We were also using iPlot, IRSV, IRSC software, MGE. Back uh, at, at those times, probably most of you uh, have also worked uh, with that software. Hopefully, I'm not the oldest. And uh, OK, it was a lot of work. We didn't have a database, so we there was no real place where all the information was available. It was spread uh, among uh, a lot of number of uh, MXD uh, files. So, for example, for uh, for different iDrum charts, that same information was displayed with a different uh, slightly different uh, probably representation on different charts. So there was no, no not a central element. So the IAP and our master files. Uh, where our our database, so to say. Okay, so this was very very time consuming. So then we decided we were looking at the market, to see what what was available out there, how we could improve our processes, etc. And then we we decided we to to make a try with uh, with GIS. That was that, that was challenging because most of us come from the CAD uh, background. Most of the people we have in the office, etc. So changing our mind to GIS uh, was really a challenge. Uh, we started back in 2009 with ArcGIS 931, I think, and what was called at that time is still PLTS Aero. So hopefully, I'm not the oldest, so some of you already knew about that product. Uh, back then, we were go. We we already had some automation tools on top of MicroStation. So okay, doing charts with MicroStation was not really that hand handmade thing. So some automation was out there, but we were looking for a shift change, so a mind change. So with CAD, always the file is the permanent thing, and we wanted to to to, to change a mind and have a database and. Uh, more automation, and we thought that GIS was an element that was, had automation on its heart. So it's a foundation of, of IS is automation. So you have some data, and you automate that data to produce elements. So that was, what, that, that's why we tried PLTS back then. It was probably not as developed as, as other tools, more specific to aviation that were at that time, but all of them were based on CAD. So we went, we went in, that, in that direction. So this is more or less the setup we, we did in this presentation. So we had in the center, we have the database. So we have an RTIS database where we store everything. And we have a different number of data management IS, IS working positions. So there's a number of people that is um, focused on getting the data from the different data originators, from different units, from the airports, from everywhere, and putting that data into the database. Uh, this is done sometimes manually, so it's uh, just getting RTIS desktop and updating those feature classes, sometimes automatic import data imports. So, but, but these people focus on having the database up to date. And there's another work position, the charting IS working position, which is in, in charge of getting that data, that, that master data, 
and building all the rules and all the representations and all the symbology that uh, all the filters etc that uh, allow us uh, to build to build those charts then those charts are exported to pdf and uh, put it in the iip so here in the right you have a couple of examples of some of the charts we were producing with with this workflow so that you hopefully you have getting a grasp on how what is the size of all these things so the identical database we, we work with is not that that very much large a number of feature classes so it's 63 feature classes but it's highly related one to another so it's 150 55 relationships within all these feature classes but it makes it really tough really uh, to understand the data model and the people to have it up to date we typically have in, in every amendment cycle a number of 50 every day a number of 52 geodatabase version so have a version in a schema so we can roll up the database and have the updates monthly on the cartographic side we have uh, 76, 77 cartographic features with the annotations and all the symbology. Uh, we have a 24 uh, chart series, 4,000 and a half uh, areas of interest, so uh, chart views, so to say, data frames. 48 extraction rules that decide what goes, what elements go goes in which chart, and uh, over 800 EST rules that are in charge of. Okay, putting the proper symbology to every element and proper the proper labeling and all that stuff. So managing all this is really, I mean, it's a lot of work, it's tough, it's good. I mean, uh, we are happy with the software. It, it gives us a, a good amount of automation, but I mean, it's, it's heavy work, what, what we are for it. Okay, so we, we were working uh, very hard on all that uh, implementation, so working very hard on updating our database and everything, but the users were still seeing this from us. So their end result for the users, it was the same. Uh, they were prettier charts, okay, uh, it's great. The RGIS allows for a lot of flexibility, so you can place everything where you want, do incredible symbology, and as it is automated, it's easier to work with it. As it's easier, we also noticed that uh, we were continuously improving our charts. So we were doing symbology changes every two, three months to improve the chart. So that was great, but it was also a lot of work. But the, the experience from, the, from our users at the end was more or less the same. That's what we noticed. So soon we, real, we realized that people were asking us a lot uh, more rather than the charts, they were asking more on, uh, okay, so what what do you have? Uh, can I merge uh, roots with seed uh, procedures? Do I have the PDFs and it's difficult to, to see the transition? Or can I see, so they were always asking for shape files, for EWG files so they, that they could use of without data. So then we realize that uh, it's great. So we have the IP, we have to do it. I mean, it's something that uh, the regulation force us to do what we need to do and this is the way to transmit that information but a real asset was the database so we were building by doing all these charts with with RGIS we were building a huge database with a lot of information with all those all those relationships and and that was what people really were were looking for so we started this insignia project okay this insignia project was okay, how we can take that database that we use for internal production, uh, how we can make the database available to others. So then we, uh, we set up the, uh, this RGIS server environment at that moment uh, with uh, our good looking applications, so GIS applications with the RGIS JavaScript API. And we were very, very happy with that. I mean, that was a huge success and uh, People started to look at the IIP and uh, at radical information in a very different way. So it's not only the charts that were already available in the IIP and the IKO mandates, but they could they, they were able to build their own charts with their own zoom scale, with their own features that they wanted. They can they can see they could, for example, start to see all the approaches to Madrid Balajas Airport and see in the interrelationships uh, among them instead of having them one chart. Uh, 
with each other. They can merge with different uh, background information. Uh, so that was, uh, I think that was a starting point uh, of a very different um, way of doing things for us at least. But, but at that moment of time, we were still doing all the IAP charts, all the EDF charts, and then all these applications. So it was, uh, it was a lot of work, was tough, maintaining, we, we were seeing that maintaining the, 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 data, the database in fact was updated every amendment. So all the information on the GS servers and the web applications was always up to date. But some of the IP charts, for example, the bigger ones I mentioned, for example, the root charts or the uh, big visual uh, charts of each, of each of one of the TMAs we have, we were lacking behind. We were only able to update our, our, our root chart twice a year. And for the TMAs charts, it was two or three times a year that we were able to update them. So between updates, the charts, the PDF charts were, were always uh, not with the latest information, and the people was relying more really on the web viewer than the, than on the actual IP charts. So mid 2019, uh, we made one step forward, and we decided that these web charts, these web maps, were really part of the IAP. So we changed our IAP. I have an example here of the L root six one uh, chart. But, sorry. I hope you can still hear me. Yep, we can still hear you, Javier. Okay, sorry. Okay, so for example, we have an example here of what we did with AIP. So this is the L root 61 chart, which is the, um, the root chart that was available on PDF uh, before and on paper, and we decided to remove it and just provide a link to our Insignia application where that chart and that uh, the features are available. So that's a picture on the right. So right now in the IAP Spain, we have a web uh, end root chart that is always up to date and uh, available to, to everyone. Uh, that was not uh, cost free, of course. So we had to, it was uh, more uh, nearly a six month uh, project uh, that while we already had that, so we already have the database, we already have the application, we, we already have that information available, but to be able to, um, to state, so to say that this is the official information and it's part of the AIP was a long process with our NSA, our National Security Agency. So we have to demonstrate them that it was having this web map was in fact safer and better than having the PDF charts updated only twice a year. So that was a strong uh, a step forward that is also liberal, uh, free resources. So this time that it took uh, to build all these uh, charts, big charts, uh, every six or four months is now free to do other tasks. And uh, for us, it's, it's, it's a big, big, big improvement. There's still people that want. The, there's still people that wants and needs these charts on paper. So we have this print, fun, print function here. So if anyone needs it on paper, they can obtain it on paper directly from our website also. And this is one of the of the lines that we are working uh, a lot of right now. So how to better integrate the IKO IFP, So all these PDF, all these tables of the with the web application, so the GIS web application. So how we can create probably more web charts or how to link one information with another. So how can we, how, how, how we can get, get more and more uh, uh, benefit from this database that is very tough and very a lot of work to have up to the updated, but that also provides these great products so that, that we can build and we couldn't in the past. So right now, really, our users are starting to see the IS with other eyes. They can do much more things than that they could in the past with only the PDF, PDF files. And, the, and this trend of database and application has really opened our, our eyes a lot. So we have seen that we have a, a, um, 
we have a, a lot of information that is key for other uh, company uh, areas. In fact, uh, the medical information is a, is a founding block for a, so some other uh, processes in the company. We are learning that we can translate our information, and I will show you, show you a little bit later one example of that. So it's not the, the IAP information that doesn't need to be extracted at the same time every way. We can transform it. As it, as it is digital, we can make that, that information different and look different to different users. But we can merge that uh, our base layers with additional information. We can analyze, do bit analysis on that information. And all that is giving us uh, a very different view of what we have in our hands. Uh, we have the skills, we have the knowledge, so we are starting to support many other uh, units within our company uh, in the business processes with, the, with our data, with our tools, and with our expertise. And, and I will talk about, hopefully very quickly, Jonathan, so I don't uh, spend too much time on this, but uh, of some of the examples that some of them are already operational that we use. For example, these, these drones uh, viewer uh, and app that we have. So we found that, uh, okay, drones are not new, but what is new is the number of people that is flying drones. And all these new people coming to the drone uh, as drone pilots, they do not have, at least here in Spain, a lot of uh, ATM background. There is a law so that they cannot fly on controlled airspace. Um, there's so many things that they can do. They cannot fly close to airports, or at least if they want to fly there, they need to have a request for permissions. But for them, it was very difficult uh, to find that information. So where is the controlled airspace? Where are the airports? Uh, and the IAP for them was an overkill. I mean, looking at the, of a, a lot of the IFR charts we have and everything was overkill. And it was also difficult for them to understand that, that an, uh, CTR is controlled airspace, that uh, a FIF is also controlled airspace. So we have a, a lot of, of, um, of names and special names on, on ITM, but people that don't come from our industry, it's very difficult for them. So we, we understood that we had to translate our message to the language they were able to, to understand. So we translate this to these alerts, advices, and, and not on messages. So we build a simplified uh, application for them where they can uh, find alerts, advice alerts, which are areas where either they cannot fly or they need to request permission to fly in. So these are the, the, the red ones. Advices, things that is good that they know if they want to fly there. For example, that if there's any danger activity going on on that area, it's good to know that. Uh, it's good that they know that it's happening and they are also able to access graphically the, the notams so they see they can see at a certain time and, and date if that impacts uh, the operation so there was really an open eye for us in that okay with the same information that we have only building the transformation every amendment without additional work we can provide a specific view for a specific user we started with the drones but we soon moved to other also to other domains. Another example was this Volcano viewer, uh, where it was really tough for some of our, our, our operational units to really understand whenever all these uh, volcano eruption exercises were taking place. After this close down we have in Europe, uh, some years ago, there was, there's been a number of exercises every year to really to, to improve our response to a volcano emission, a future volcano emission. So, but at least, at least for operational people, what's very difficult to really understand, okay, we got all these messages from the volcanic advisory centers. So isn't there a way that we can see that information in the IAP or in your insignia project? So what we did that uh, was to be done in Porter. So we can now import uh, BIA messages and display them uh, on a map together with other environmental information like airports or routes, etc. So this is a, a project where we understood that putting some additional information on top of IS information is really a strong asset and it gives additional value to our information. So just by importing this BAR, PAA, CIS, uh, uh, circulars, we can 
give even more value to our own data. So that was really, a, this tool is also operational right now, not used very much, hopefully we don't have to use it a lot with additional volcanoes, but uh, was interesting. So coming from, from those experience, we also have a request from the operational people. So, and we have right now also operational this application, which is the ATF CM map, uh, eye traffic flow management, uh, capacity management plan. So in Spain, we have a number, and just let me check because I have it here. We have a number of um, ATC units, uh, 12 ATC units that are responsible for their own sector configuration on the geographical area. So for approach, for en route, uh, etc., for different areas, there is this ATC units that set up, depending on the traffic uh, per, uh, uh, forecast for that day, they set up the, their sectors. If the traffic is higher than the forecast, they also need to do regulations, okay? So they need to regulate traffic on some sectors, etc. So even though each of those units had their own local information on their tools, it was difficult to have an overview picture of what was going, what was happening on the whole uh, company with the other, with all the other uh, units between neighbor units, etc. Sorry. So we build this tool. So the idea of this tool, we are not replacing any ATC tools. So the ATC, the service provision is, is still done with ATC tools that uh, are built for it and have all, all, that, all those processes. But we, what we built was this, so to say, task for lookalike control panel where from uh, you can quickly see what's going on in your area and also in the, in the neighborhood one. So in green, you can see the current uh, sector configuration. So the number of sector, the number of eye traffic controllers that are this, at that time uh, doing the duty. If a sector is close to 90% capacity, that sector is bordered in yellow. So the neighborhood, the neighborhood uh, controllers know that this guy is close to uh, to full capacity, and they try not to put additional uh, traffic over that sector. And when that sector is already over capacity and a regulation needs to be placed to be sure that no one else is flying through that sector, we have all this, uh, all this uh, additional symbology, which change in color from yellow to red, depending on how high the, the load uh, really is. So, some other tools that we are working on, this and this is, is for future projects, goes more in line with the analysis. So this is a radar coverage map that takes into account uh, a number of radars uh, available in Spain and on the different colors you can see at a specific high level, high level 100 uh, this time, if there's radar coverage in an area or not. And how many radars are seeing that uh, piece of space. So this is something that our CN CNS guys have asked us to do. We already had all that information and they were saying, okay, we are having to assess some of these things with, with specific tools and manually we need to assess that. It would be great if we can have a complete integrated picture of his coverages with, together with the higher spaces, with the routes, et cetera, and even be able uh, to do analysis on them. So detect what happens if I lose one radar the situation degrades and what ATH routes will be affected. So this is a project we're currently working on and looks very interesting. And it's the first time we are really leveraging the analysis to uh, power of GIS within our data. So it's data that we already had, putting some analysis on top of it, it gives additional uh, information and knowledge that was difficult to, to obtain before. And the last project I wanted to talk about is this real-time uh, data. So uh, another thing that we have been asked to is, would it be possible to see on top of your end route charts the position of the airplanes? That was the answer. I would say, let us take a look. And, and we build a prototype with this uh, geo-event uh, piece that the uh, ArcGIS uh, already has. 
where we can ingest data from different data sources. So this is an example, for example, of, that, of the Eurocontrol data source. So we get traffic not only from Spain, but from other countries, surrounding countries. And we can plot that in a map. Again, this is not to replace any of the ATC tools that we already have. So this is a non-operational tool, but it's providing additional insight on the data. And one of the power elements of that is that we can do also analysis on that, uh, on that data, for example. So here we have the traffic flows for Madrid Balajas over one day. So you can easily see the trends of where, is, where the traffic is concentrating and maybe take decisions uh, based on these elements. So this is also an, a very promising uh, tool that we, we hope to be able to, to deliver at least the first version during this year. And just for, for end, I think I already mentioned before, so I think that we are IS units have robust data management processes in place. We know how to deal with data with high volumes of changing data. Um, we already have the tools and knowledge uh, of how to really manage data, data, data properly. And um, with RTIS, we have also the ability to plug additional information on top of it. So I think that at least in our case, we are very, very, very proud that we are being able to support other units within the company uh, with tools, with data, with analysis that uh, can can really give our IS data the value that it has. So, more or less, Jonathan, I think more or less. This no, is that's it. fantastic, uh, Javier. I, I think you showed a lot of great uh, applications of, of what you're what you're doing there, and and I agree. I hope we don't have to use your volcanic application anytime soon. Um, one of the things that stood out um, towards the end of your presentation there that you said is you're not replacing some of these systems. You were, you were talking about ATC in particular, that you're, you're using GIS to provide additional insight and really augment some of the existing systems. I thought that was an, an interesting point that, uh, that you made there. Um, are there any, you know, from, from what you've seen, are there any um, divisions within Inair that have, I think, that have taken to that that have used or maybe had the most value out of the GIS system outside of the AIS unit? I think so. Uh, we have two units that are really, uh, two of the units that are really getting a lot of, of, of it. One, one of them is the, our simulation unit. I didn't talk during the presentation about it, but this is how, these are the guys that do fast time simulation. So they have to build an environment and then they put a lot of airplanes there and see what happens. So in the past, they had to build all those scenarios by hand, taking the IAP and upload, up, updating all the databases. Mm -hmm. Right now, they are being able to connect to our services because all this, the beauty of all this thing, for me, at least for me, is that all these applications run on RTIS services. So the data is, is, is there also. So the people that wants to get that data can get it from there. So these guys we, right now build their environments based on IS or on our data. So they're free, error free, or hopefully error free. Uh, so that's one of them. The other ones are ops, operational people. ATC systems are very expensive to evolve. To evolve. Putting graphical tools on top of them is very expensive, it takes a lot of time. And for them, the quick development of this GIS application that within uh, two or three months we can de deliver really very incredible views for them, it's really helping them understand the data in a different way. Yeah, I think that will be the most. Right. Well, great. Thank, thank you once again, Javier. I really appreciate um, you sharing all of the work that you've done. You've done quite a bit of work over the, over the, over the years. So once again, I appreciate it. Thank you, Jonathan.